everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. We're here in Brooklyn, New York with Josh Nisley or Nisley? Again? Nisley. Nisley. Okay. I know it's got to make sure and get that right. Um, but there's, this is a topic that, that I've heard about recently and really piqued my interest. I know it's something you're really interested in as, in as well. And that is Jesus as a refugee. Um, we don't really think of that. We always think of his time of ministry and, you know, all of the miracles and times with his disciples, whatever. But we tend to forget that they, you know, he and his family fled to Egypt when he was a small child and lived there for many years. Walk us through that. Explain that a little. And then also, how does that change our perception of who Jesus is? I think before starting at Jesus, you, you have to sort of step back and go all the way back to Genesis. Because one of the things that as I started looking at this, um, the, the Bible is just full of stories of God caring for displaced people. Like huh. nearly every single, what we would consider hero or major figure in the Bible was displaced at one point or other in their life. So like the, the, the classic example is Abraham. You know, God said, just go. Like I'm not telling you where, just go. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he packed up and left and he went. Mm -hmm. And God, you know, a lot of Genesis is watching God take care of Abraham through that journey. But you know, it, it doesn't stop there. There's um, you know, Joseph gets sold as a slave um, for a nation. You know, it, it's it's um, all this, this care for people that end up in places that are new, you don't understand the language, you don't know the culture, it, it's confusing. King David, for example, you know, w spent a good portion of his life on the run from Saul, mm -hmm. you know, hiding in caves and trying not to get killed. And then, yeah, we get to Jesus, and then after Jesus, there's like the, the apostles, the early church, you know, basically spent their life on the run. But, but Jesus, yeah, you know, he has that, that early fleeing, you know, into Egypt and to save his life, essentially. Mm -hmm. and, and then after that, you know, we see all the way through his ministry, he's, he's itinerant. He has, you know, it says, I have no place to lay my head. Yeah. He's, he's always on the run. There's no, there's no home base. There's no, like, center of operations. He's just itinerant. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think that ought to change the way that we look at the Bible. Mm -hmm. The way that we, it, once you start seeing the Bible through that, len that lens, you, there's almost no escaping it. Almost every story is, wow. is filled with this idea. And, you know, there's no um, teaching, thou shalt love the refugee in the New Testament, there certainly is in the Old. But, but that idea of God's love, God's heart for displaced people, I think is unavoidable. That's really interesting. You even have like the children of Israel. You, you had basically an entire people who spent significant portions of their history on the move or in foreign lands, Assyria, you know, Syria, Babylon, um, Egypt. So what are the implications of that? So this is a thread we see throughout scripture, especially we're thinking in the case of Jesus, What's the implications for our theology? I think one of the things, there's this idea um, throughout the Bible that a relationship with God, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is what ultimately be brings belonging. So in the same way that a relationship with God is the only way to true peace, uh, a relationship with God is the only way to really find belonging. So there's this idea of, look at all these characters that were all over the place, but still were able to find peace. You, know, you think of David writing the Psalms, able mm -hmm. to find peace in the middle of you know, chaos, middle of being displaced. I think that's a, um, one aspect. There's another aspect that's just, um, God really has a heart for people that are displaced. You know, you could ask why, and the Bible doesn't necessarily always answer that question, but it's clear, you look at the text, uh, God, cares about those people that are, in a special way, those people that, that are on the run. You, you go through the Old Testament, the term that's often translated stranger, effectively means immigrant. And so mm. you see, repeatedly, br bring the immigrant into your feast, care for the immigrant, don't take advantage of the immigrant, love the immigrant. It's just again and again and again, you, you can't escape it. And wow. yeah, I think that has implications for how we live. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very much so. So what would be the implications then specifically for Jesus and what his, um, his work on earth was, considering that he started it out as a, as a displaced person? Well, certainly you can, you can carry out ministry um, to, uh, in the middle of displacement. I think that's maybe mm -hmm. part of it. But there's also this idea of Jesus was 
I think, modeling part of, of how we're to live. And that's not to say that we should all live as displaced people, mm -hmm. but there is this idea that we, we can't find, we, we, we must not find or try to find ultimate belonging here on earth, like in, the, uh, in where we live, in what we live in, you know, in our financial security. One of the, the constant temptations, I think especially in America where we're so economically secure, is to say, this world is my home. Like, I'm setting up shop here, this is where I belong, and I'm going to make myself secure here, I'm gonna make myself comfortable here, and the call of the gospel is effectively to be displaced no matter where you are. Th this world, um, I am here, I'm a part of this world, but this is not ultimately where I find belonging. Mm -hmm. This is not ultimately where I find meaning or security. So there's this idea that in a sense we are displaced maybe em emotionally or psychologically, <laughs> yeah. uh, even if we, we you know, own a house and live in an area and, and stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's like Jesus was modeling that for us. Um, but, I mean, at the same time, he did have a hometown, but, but there's big chunks of his life when he was on the move. And, wow, yeah, yeah, that makes you think about it a little differently. You know, and I think it's, it's interesting. Anabaptists um, started out, like the whole movement was started out by people on the run, people you know, losing their home, trying <laughs> to stay alive. Uh -huh. And there's, there's great stories of people, of Anabaptists, Mennonites, migrating uh, to the New World, migrating out of Europe, out of Russia, um, into the U.S., into Canada, into Paraguay, mm -hmm. and how God took care of those people in the midst of that. And so we, I think we have this sort of this uh, idealized view of us as being the scrappy underdogs, but the reality is Anabaptists more or less live comfortable, solidly middle-class, stable lives, and, mm -hmm. and the, the temptation in that context is going to be, I want to make myself comfortable, I want to set up shop here, this is... Um, this is where I make my home. Yeah, that's a real that's a real temptation. It's so easy to do. That's the thing, you know, because you want to be secure. Every every person wants that, you know, and it's so easy to want to fall into that. Framing Jesus as a refugee or as a displaced person, how does that affect our obedience to His call on our lives? I think there's maybe two aspects. One is um, once you have let go of of your home, your community, as the as the ultimate place you find belonging, mm -hmm. it frees you up to, to be mobilized, either um, to go overseas as part of sharing the gospel, that kind of thing. It allows us to be mobile, and I think Christians are called to have a global view, to consider um, sharing the gospel um, in many different cultures. But I think there's another one, um, and that is just God's call to love the stranger, love the immigrant. Mm. Uh, one, one of the things, again, I think that we as conservative and Baptists have allowed conservative politics to, to push us in is this idea of how do we view um, people coming into our communities who are not like us? Uh, how do we view people that have, have grown up somewhere, been born somewhere, and are, and are immigrating, are being displaced into our communities? Starting with the Old Testament, um, the whole law, the teaching there, and Jesus' example, and then we see the early church. Like, through that whole thing, it's unavoidable. God cares about the immigrant, and God says we are, we are to love them as one of our own and, and to bring them in. And it's one of those things where I think in, in current culture, we will be swimming against the tide, but we, we've got to do it if we're going to maintain the, the purity of the gospel. Yeah, that, that could radically affect how you live and how you interact with the community around you, for sure. That's the last, last question I had. Is there anything else you would like to add? I, I think that the, I think that the church uh, through, through the early 20th century, or sorry, the mid 20th century, mid 20th century, my, my history further back is fuzzy, but I, I clearly see a trend starting in the mid 20th century with the church pulling political issues and, and taking routes of convenience rather than radical calls to the gospel. I realize this view may not be popular, but, but if we look at King David's life, King David, I see his life as pre and post Bathsheba, right? Mm -hmm. so, so before Bathsheba, things were going well, God was blessing him, he was following God, and after Bathsheba, things just went sideways, went downhill. And this is just my personal opinion. Uh, you can argue with me on this one. Um, I, I do have yet to find a credible pushback, but it's my belief that the Americans church, American churches 
Bathsheba moment was its failure to address segregation and racism in the mid 20th century. So that is when the church took a stance and said, there's clear teaching that um, there is neither Jew nor Greek uh, in the eyes of God. There's, there's clear teaching that the gospel is for all people, but we are going to, for political convenience, for economic advantage, we are going to ignore that almost to a man. I mean, there were exceptions, but the exceptions proved the rule. Uh, we are going to step away from that and we're, we're effectively going to, to ignore what the gospel says on this. So there was that and there was also divorce and remarriage. It sets up, I think, I think that was the church's Bathsheba moment. I, I think getting back, if it ever will, will start with going back to that and saying we were wrong and let's set that one right. Mm -hmm. um, but how that applies here is I see the church starting to do the same thing today with immigration. With, say, with allowing uh, conservative politics to dictate and to trump what the Bible clearly teaches about how we treat other people. I think there will be, there will be heavy uh, moral and spiritual consequences. You know, th part of the reason that, that the failure to confront racism was so deadly, I think there are two reasons. One is there is something spiritual that happens when a movement says we are going to ignore the gospel teaching that we, we, you can read it, it's, it's unescapable. We're going to ignore that teaching for the sake of expediency. So there was something spiritual that happened there that I think mm -hmm. led to the decline of the church. But also what happened is the church allowed, by and large, allowed the humanist movement to take the charge on racism. The, the church effectively ceded the moral high ground to secularism. And so now when, mm -hmm. when people come and say, you know, yeah, you oppose homosexuality, but look, you also opposed desegregation. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't like black people, you don't like immigrants, you don't like homosexuals, it's all the same thing. It's not the same thing, mm -hmm. but because we ceded the moral high ground, you know, 70 years ago, um, it's now a very tough claim to come back and say, no, 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 we realize now we were wrong on racism, but somehow homosexuality is different. It is deeply different, it's very different, but because w we allowed humanists effectively to act more in line with the gospel in this matter, um, I think American Christianity will always be uh, on, the, on its back feet, mm -hmm. um, on its heels in relation to morality. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, part of my heart cry with, with immigration right now is we have a similar moment right now. You know, we, it's, instead of African Americans, it's people coming from overseas, but we, we have a choice. Are we going to love those people and adopt them and radically say, uh, I don't care what is, you know, economically ideal. What is just the way the world works? What is um, what my conservative neighbors are telling me? I'm going to follow the call of the gospel. Or are we going to to allow, you know, the, the, the conservative political realm dictate how we feel about these things? And it's my belief that 50 years from now, we will look back on this moment the same way that we're now looking back on racism. Like it will be unescapable what was the right decision, and the consequences are just as big. I think we've got an opportunity, and I think we're in the process of blowing it. Mm -hmm. And so we, wow. we've got to, to, I think, change the way that we think. I think we've got to change who we're listening to, and say we're going to follow the gospel. Mm -hmm. Actually bring it back to what the scriptures say about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it goes back to um, what Larry Hurtado says in uh, destroyer of the gods. The early church was radically multicultural, multi-ethnic, and that, that astonished people. It astonished people back then, and it will astonish people today if we actually pull it off. That idea that um, I will adopt people that are different than me because of th there's this, this spiritual plane that trumps any other differences um, was shocking back then, and it's going to be shocking now yeah. if you can do it. Wow, that's um, it, it's, it's a high bar. Uh, that's set by God and by scripture, but you know at the same time it's something that I think our churches can do It's just a matter of if we are willing to do it. Yeah, the early church did it. It's, yeah. it's doable yeah. it, This is not like some platonic ideal that you know isn't actually doable. It's mm -hmm. doable But it's going to take radical change. Wow, that's powerful. That's a that's a lot to think about right there <laughs> Yeah, wow I'm really curious what our audience is going to think, and, and maybe if they have lots of questions, we can point them your way. So. Sounds true. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Josh. It's for, my pleasure. For joining us. Yes, my pleasure. this was good.